We're having a conversation today with Jeff Tate, who is an actual Athens native, been here all his life, and for many generations his family has been in this town as well. Uh, he had a music degree and played professionally for several years. He also uh, worked in commercial TV and public TV here in Georgia. He was a house husband, he worked in the hospitality industry, and then he had a long career at the library of more than 20 years. So we appreciate your speaking with us. You could talk about so many different things. We'll, we'll try to, to give people a little bit of an idea about what it was like growing up in Athens during, say, some of the years leading into the baby boomer years when things were so interesting, you say, for young people because of the university access and resources. I remember growing up, uh, we had uh, a huge family that lived in the same house. My grandparents lived in one wing. My great aunt who owned the house lived in a wing. And the four of us lived in three rooms on one side of the house. The things that I remember earliest from, let's say, the late 40s were we had uh, two African-American ladies that worked for us that were great definers of us, both my brother and myself. Uh, we were in cahoots with both of them. Uh, they would come to work one day a week. Both of my parents worked. And about once every two months, I would get dreadfully ill. I think they were on to me. The parents would go away. My brother would go to school. And Lucy Bell Williams and I would make pimento cheese sandwiches and go up in the attic where we could spy on the neighbors with binoculars. Now, I was deathly ill. We had lied. I had made up a lie. So we were in cahoots. She was not allowed to smoke in the house. But since this was a holiday, since I had already sinned and lied, and we were in the attic spying on the neighbors, she was allowed to smoke in the attic. But she was a very special person to both my brother and I, as both of our parents worked. She would go to Chicago occasionally, and she, uh, when she was gone, there was a second person that would come and take her place. And we would, she would, uh, they would come and cook one day and do a little cleaning. Ironing was very big in the late 40s and the early 50s. Pillowcases have to be ironed. Give me a break, she would say. <laughs> but we never had a TV. Uh, we were probably different from every other house on the street. Is we never had a television. Father and mother both had English degrees, and they thought that if we had a television, we would never learn to read. So we did have a radio, and the, well, some of the nicest remembrances are Lucy doing the ironing, spying on the neighbors with her upstairs, and the biggest treat was there was a bus that ran Millage to Prince to the Double Barrel Cannon to Five Points and back. It cost a nickel, and Lucy Bell would take us and ride the bus, but this was during segregation, so we would have to sit at the back of the bus with her, but we quickly learned that the stories were better back there. There was more action at the back of the bus, so my brother and I would sit there and take the tour, and uh, she was a very strong influence on, on both of us, though, growing up. How did that affect you having to see these people that you respected and admired and 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 lived with every day treated like that did you did you comprehend it as oh, a child oh not as a child on? a 5 6 year old child was not aware of segregation i, I knew that uh, we had to sit at the back of the bus because lucy was with us uh, we got around it once when lucy went to chicago nanny took her place laura livingston and we became in cahoots, like Lucy and I used to go in the attic and spy so she could smoke cigarettes and spy on the neighbors. Nanny called me once when I was about 10 or 9 and said, Jeff, come over here to my house. I went to her house and she said, listen, there's a Victor Mature movie on downtown called Samson and Delilah. I want you to take me. Now this is during segregation. But Nanny had very light skin and white hair, and she knew she could pass for white. So I took her down to see Samson and Delilah. I paid the ticket. The two of us went in, saw Samson and Delilah. Very dramatic movie for me. Her favorite movie star, Victor Mature, she, hey, he looked like Sylvester Stallone. She had a picture of him in her house. So we sat there. 
and at the most dramatic scene where Samson has been blinded and he is being taunted in the arena by the Philistines. They've thrown a net over him. They're kicking him and they lead him between the two great columns that hold the temple up. The very dramatic scene where he's trying to push the columns down but and everyone is laughing at him. They think this he does, but his hair has grown back. And there was a scene where you see the column in the tear and it moves <laughs> like that. And Nanny and I both held each other like that as Samson successfully tore the whole building down, killing everyone. And she turned to me and said, you see, Jeff, they mocked him. And he fixed those Philistines. That to me was the great Sunday school lesson of growing up. They mocked Samson and he fixed them. We talked about that, Nanny and I, for years. And now we go forward to when she's over a hundred years old at St. Mary's nursing home. And I would go over there and I would say, Nanny, do you remember when Samson fixed the Philistines? And I realized that not only did she not remember Samson, but she had no earthly idea who I was. But I used to visit her, and those two African-American ladies were very central to me and my brother growing up after World War II and in the early 50s, as both of our parents were. Another thing I remember was as a young child, nine years old, ten years old, there were fabulous things you could do in Athens that a parent did not have to go. You can't do that now. A ten-year-old boy could not get on his bicycle and go anywhere he wanted. But as a child, I was allowed to go to the fine arts building by myself and take a trombone lesson. I was allowed to go to the track, which was right below Memorial Hall then in Watchcoats Towns, a great hero. He had won the 1936 High Hurdles 13-7 in front of Adolf Hitler, who was having a bad day. Jesse Owens had beat the uh, Nazi Aryan sprinters, and Speck Towns had won, and later in two years, Joe Lewis would beat Max Schmeling. Hitler had a bad period in there. But we could go watch the swimming team practice in Stegman Hall, where the great Reed Patterson, an Olympic swimmer, was. We could go and watch the track team. We could hear the band practice, which was in the Foreign Legion post, now gone, which was down there. And best of all, on Sunday afternoons, there were foreign movies in the fine arts uh, theater. And we could go there and watch foreign movies. I remember uh, Rififi, which was later rebate. And of course, it had the subtitles the subtitles so you could understand them. And years later, when I became a house husband, the only thing I contributed to being, to the literature of being a house husband, I had two young children and I couldn't keep them away from the television. I said, okay, I've lost the fight for the television, but I could get them for Leedy movies, which had subtitles. <laughs> so if I had, the, my children were going to watch movies, I would get Fellini movies and I remember my wife came home and looked and there was Anita Ekberg taking off her clothes dancing in a fountain in Rome but there were subtitles and I thought just as my reading was helped by watching the fine arts movies when I was 10 and 11 years old my children if they were going to watch television they might as well watch quality films and learn to read at the, at the same, same, at time. The same but time. But Athens growing up then was segregated, of course, and... Uh, well, that's the way, as you got a little bit older, integration came into play, and your father was well known for how he reacted at the University of Georgia during the integration at the university. Your father, William Tate, was dean of men for more than 20 years at the University of Georgia. 40, I think. 40. 40. It's at the it, University it, 40, I think, a dean of is. men for more than yeah. 20. And, of course, the Tate Student Center is named after your father. And one of the things he was known for that in 1961, when the two first African-American students came to um, the University of Georgia, um, he said that that was the law and he was going to try and make sure that it was, a, was peaceful, whereas at other southern universities it hadn't been. Do you remember that period and, and, and Quite what well. he was doing and how Quite it might well. affect you at home? I was uh, a senior in high school 
and Charlene and Hamilton came and most people were worried about Hamilton the African-American male coming to the Southern University we were afraid something that happened like in Mississippi or something happened in Alabama so Hamilton was hidden in a house one block from where we lived with Reverend Killian everyone knew where Charlene was there was a huge riot there the dormitory she was yeah living. the dormitory in North Myers very dramatic first. moment where uh, Daddy and Charlene went back to uh, Atlanta one night you know they never knew where Hamilton was those were scary times we got a bomb scare called into the house uh, father one morning was having breakfast and he says there's an article in the Augusta Chronicle about your father written by Roy Harris a noted segregationist where they said that father had insulted his heritage by using his ability to integrate the University of Georgia and I said so Mr. Harris is your enemy he says sometimes you can judge people by their enemies yes Roy Harris is my enemy he said and so the integration was frightening a father told us not to talk to anybody he says there's a lot of people in town the clan is going to be here the news people are going to be here if they found out that you were my son they could ask you questions and so you don't know nothing you keep your mouth shut you go to high school you come home you don't answer the phone just you know lay low until this whole thing quiets over and years later when Charlene came back she was being interviewed and she remembered father very well but he was an imposing man he was a big he was scary and uh, and she said that when she would walk with daddy the students would be there but they would part like the Red Sea as soon as they saw him because he would throw him out of school and and he was a uh, you didn't want to fool with him. He was well, very successful yeah. at that. Yeah, in the, some of the biographies, they called him stern but compassionate, sort of tough but fair. He was noted for if he caught a student doing something wrong, grabbing him by the back of the collar and hauling him off and, and, and taking away their IDs, checking their IDs. So he, he it was a scary him. thing. If he got your ID, you had to go to his office and talk to him. And you couldn't talk around him. You couldn't say, now nah, here's what really happened. It <laughs> didn't work. Wally Butts, the University of Georgia coach, goes into Daddy's office and says, Bill, you're going down to Jessup, Georgia this week. Now, I understand you're making a speech down there, and there is a boy down there that we want. <laughs> we need that boy very much, but Bill, he's not a quick study. He's going to have a lot of trouble with his grades, and Georgia Tech wants him. And Bobby Dodd has already gone down there twice. I want you to go down there. I want you to take that boy's family out to the biggest steak dinner they've ever had. I want you to tell them that we're going to take there of that boy at the University of Georgia. We're going to get him a tutor if he's tra has trouble with classes. We're going to get him a job in the summer. We're going to make sure he gets a degree in physical education and can coach if he wants to. We're going to take care of him. It's part of a family. And I want make sure that his family understands that. Now the rest of the story is told by Coach Bobby Dodd at a Georgia Tech recruiting school. He said, so I go down to Jessup, Georgia. I go down there and uh, I take the family out to a steak dinner, biggest steak dinner they've ever had. <laughs> and I tell them how if they boy goes to Georgia Tech, we're going to help that boy get a degree. It's a family at Georgia Tech. We're going to get him a job in the summer. We're going to help him <laughs> if he has trouble with any of the classes. And the, the boy listens to that, and they go down, and they go back to the boy's house. And the boy says, Coach Dodd, would you like to see my room? And Coach Dodd says, yes, yes, I'd love to. They go to his room, and there by his bed is not a Bible. It's a calculus book. And Coach Dodd says, well, this is wonderful. You are making yourself familiar with one of the courses that some of our students struggle with. I'm glad you're making it. He says, Coach Dodd, I want to talk to you. Two weeks ago, big fellow comes down from Georgia named Tate something, Gate Tate something, I don't know. He takes us out to that steak dinner. We sit there for two hours. 
he tells one story another about growing up in North Georgia, about this, about that. He doesn't talk about the school. He doesn't talk about being a family. He doesn't talk about a job. No, talk about any of that. When it's finally over, we go out to the parking lot, and this fellow says, son, come over here. I want to talk to you for me. He pulls me away from my family, and he says, son, if you want to graduate from Georgia Tech, you're going to have to pass this course. And he hits him in the belly with the calculus book and says, now let's go back and talk to your parents. So the boy had, had two weeks to study that calculus book. His dad said, Coach Dodd says, you could see him approaching it from one way and then another and turning it upside down. And the boy went to the University of Georgia on the basis <laughs> of father's 10 seconds saying, son, if you want to graduate from Tech, <laughs> bam, you're going to have to pass, pass that calculus. course, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the one that my wife likes so much is daddy's dead, we have his funeral. After two days, we go back to Atlanta. I live in Atlanta then. And we go to a very fancy restaurant. I've forgotten the name of it. It was an Italian restaurant called the Grotto or something. It was downstairs, very fancy restaurant. We have to wait for a table. We're waiting there. Waiter comes and says, party of two, Tate. And they said, okay, so I get up and leave. This guy comes up and he starts talking to me. And I'm saying, thank you, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. We go to the table and my wife is cracking up. I said, the hell are you laughing at? And she says, did you hear what he said? And I said, no, I, I had just heard so many people saying everything and I was saying thank you so much. I appreciate She said, Dean Tate kicked me out of school once and my brother twice. I'm glad the SOB is gone. I'm saying thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's wonderful of you to say that, you know. After he died, I found all these rifles and pistols in the attic. And I said, who, who are those? And my mother said, I don't know. Your father got them. And so I've, I've called Father's secretary, Laura Smith, my mother's cousin, who was Daddy's secretary for umpteen years. They got a Lucy Cobb, Mama and Laura had. And Laura said every now and then a student would get drunk and he'd have a pistol or a rifle and he'd shoot it off in the dorm. The pistol and the rifle would be confiscated and he had to go to Dean Tate's office to get it back. And frequently they would just pack their bags and go home rather than deal with him. <laughs> so over the years he collected uh, three or four rifles and two or three pistols. As soon as my children grew up there, I didn't want them to find them. So I took them and sold them. I didn't want to have them in the house. but. He was remembered warmly by uh, most people that dealt with him, but he was there at a different time. Something called in loco parentis, where he worked instead of the law. If, if a student got in trouble, instead of going through the police and whatnot, frequently the complaint would come to father and he would decide what to do if there was a fine he would give the boy the fine and the money he collected from the fines he would loan out to students that were in danger of leaving school because they didn't have the money. Now you couldn't do that now. You couldn't have one administrator who uh, collected fines because there was no recourse if he said you broke that person's window, you got drunk and threw that beer can in that church and you're going to pay for the window, you're going home and you, this, that and the other and someone would come saying, Dean Tate, I'm, I have to leave school. And he would say, what's the problem? And he said, well, uh, daddy's sick and I got to go work on the farm or something like that. And daddy would say, well, with this amount of money get you through a little bit and he would loan the boy the money from the fund that he could collect it from the others. Nowadays you couldn't get away with that. People would think, oh it's corrupt and he's doing this and the other. There were many stories about him. I mean the punishment fit the crime sort of thing. Or, it, but or there was no recourse. You yeah. could go to President Idaho, but in all the years they worked together, Idaho never reversed a single decision of daddy's. He trusted Daddy implicitly. He knew he was fair, he was straight. You could tell by his clothes in his car, he wasn't taking the money, <laughs> you know? So, and we still lived in three rooms in that house. I mean, it was... 
He was such a strong personality. How did that affect you growing up? Did, did you sometimes feel like you were in the shadow of someone? Was it hard? I wasn't frightened of him, but he did frighten a lot of people. I, I would go with him, especially if he was raiding like a fraternity house or a party or something, or terrible things, like whenever there was a, a wreck and a student was in the hospital, if he was taking care of me, I'd have to go with him to those, you know. But uh, he had a hard job. I think he was proudest of the role he played in the university as far as it was being peaceful, its integration. And later, his role as a peacekeeper during the Vietnam demonstrations, although I did not live here during those times. He was well known around the state, you were telling me. He you, made or, or after dinner speeches, speeches practically in every county. That's what he liked to do. Uh, that's, he was not at home that much in the evening. Uh, he would go to rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, talent shows, high school graduations. I went with him for a while. He wanted somebody to keep him awake when he was driving back at night. His brother Carter had fallen asleep and died as a result of riding in a car. So I'd, I'd stay awake and keep Daddy awake, not by my talking to him, by him talking to me. He told stories all the time. He was always on. That's, that's what he did, you know. We'd sit in the car and he says, now son, we're going to drive to LaGrange, Georgia, and here are five things that I think are going to happen in the next six years. And I'd say, yes, sir. <laughs> and we'd drive to LaGrange, Georgia, and whatnot. There were many stories about him. Though. Any of those kind of a short anecdote you can tell about? They told the you one that told he was most embarrassed by was uh, he went down to Reed Hall. Father spoke perfect grammar. He had taught my mother as a freshman she was a freshman at Georgia. She once made one error in a theme, I think knowing her probably deliberately to see if he would catch it. And of course he caught it. And he wrote her a poem on the side by the error using all incorrect verb forms. She am gone, she am went, she am <laughs> left I all alone. Must she never come to me, must I always go to her. Ah that can never was. That was the first time they met in that class. And But the story that embarrassed him the most was there was a student in trouble and daddy went down and knocked on the student's door at Reed Hall. This is late at night. The student said, who is it? And father says, it's me, Dean Tate. And he says, no. Dean Tate would have said, it is I, predicate nominative. And father got so embarrassed. <laughs> pulled his hat down, turned around, and just let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the, one of the most interesting families that I ever heard about. We should probably let people know that, that you're still living in the same house you grew up in. You're still right. living there to this day, and that your children were the sixth generation in that that's house. Right. That's right, the a very sixth generation. House here in Athens. The Tate Barra House, house although Daddy never owned it. It was always the Barra House, but they call it the Tate Barra House. You plan to stay there? As long as I can. I'll be carried out feet first. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking with well, us, Jeff. We so really much. appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.